Tonight's speaker, Susan Todd Rocky, is an independent scholar, a writer, a lecturer, and a critic on art history and the photographic arts. She's taught at the Atlanta College of Art, Georgia Tech, Georgia State, and Spelman College. She's also been a guest lecturer on various subjects here at the High Museum since 1988, and has spoken on a range of artists from Andy Warhol through to Joseph Sudek. She's also guest lectured widely at Emory University, Oglethorpe University, and Agnes Scott College. Susan's published work includes several essays in the Encyclopedia of 20th Century Photography, which is published by Routledge and Taylor and Francis out of the UK, and the monograph for First Light, The Nexus Photographers. She's also the author of many freelance articles for periodicals such as Art Papers and the Public Art Review. Her past community service includes serving on the boards of Atlanta Celebrates Photography, the Photo Forum of the High Museum of Art, and the Association of Georgia Lawyers for the Arts, among others. But perhaps most importantly, Susan is a co-founder of Atlanta Celebrates Photography and its annual lecture series and public art initiative, an organization that is thriving today and owes much of its success to Susan and a handful of other far-sighted individuals who ardently believe that there is a genuine passion for the medium of photography in our community. And as if all that were not enough, uh, this fall, Susan curated a terrific exhibition of the photographs of Sylvia Plaki, who many of you heard speak in this auditorium a month or so ago. Uh, that was at the Mason Muir of Fine Art. And uh, she's also organized an exhibition which is currently on view at the Scene Gallery in Decatur. Uh, that runs through November 16th and includes the work of Chip Simone, Lucinda Bunnan, and Robert Alter. Please join me in welcoming Susan Todd Rocky. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I really appreciate your battling that traffic out there, and, and especially on a beautiful night like this. I wanted to pause just a moment and thank all the collectors who shared their experiences, their time with me, because without you, I wouldn't be able to talk about you and your work. So I appreciate your passion, and I hope to convey that by honoring your collection tonight. And finally, I want to uh, acknowledge the dedication of Julian Cox in building bridges with the Atlanta photography community by curating this exhibition so that we can all learn and work together to make this a better place for artists and collectors. Now, tonight, inspired collecting. My objective tonight is to add to the discussion about collecting photography why, what, and what, well, specifically, what local collectors are interested in by looking at the works, some of the thoughts about the works themselves, and any special reasons why the collectors chose the work. I met with many of the lenders and asked some very general questions because I wanted them to really talk about their ideas more. I asked them what inspired you to collect, why this particular work, and how did you go about collecting it? I learned so much as well about the Atlanta history of collecting. For example, as one collector stated to me, there has been a vibrant pho photographic community here for a long time. We know that the High began its collection in the early 1970s. With the help of m several major collectors here in Atlanta, Photography and collecting flourished in the 80s and 90s. This phenomena was enhanced with the growth of galleries, galleries owned by Jay Krause, David Heath, Faye Gold, Jane Jackson, as well as the vibrancy of nonprofits that started in the 70s and 80s, Nexus Photographic Co Cooperative, the Atlanta Photography Group, and of course, in the late 1990s, I'm sorry. Okay. Atlanta celebrates photography, brought photography to the forefront of collecting. If I could have the lights down in the first slide, please. Now, about the collectors. 
whose work has been lent for this exhibition. Several of them began collecting in the 1970s. In fact, one person in the 1960s. Many of them remembered their first purchase. Andre Kertes photograph, a Walker Evans, a Prentice Polk, an Ansel Adams. And they oftentimes credited a class that they took, whether it was art history or in photography itself, which gave them knowledge and appreciation for the medium, as well as what it was like to be an artist. In fact, one recommended that I read again Robert Adams's Why People Photograph. Many of the collectors are first-generation collectors. Some of them are actively collecting, others are pausing, and many of them said they are running out of room. I wanted to start with Distortions by Andre Cortez and a detail of one of the images. This is one of several groupings in the exhibition. Cartage made this series in 1933 during his brief influence from the pa Parisian surrealist circles, of which he had become friends with many of them. Some of, the, uh, some of this work was part of a commission uh, from a French ma uh, magazine. Cartage referred to them as his masterpiece. This is what the collector rec recognized as well. When you look at the singular images. Some of them are to complete abstraction. Others le are less complex. And yet all are within the observable world before a circus mirror. The collector, who is in fact a photographer herself, saw the beauty and amazing quality in the swelling, elongated figures. Now, Another kind of distortion, but through a different kind of process, is the work of Ouija. Ouija, of course, known for his gritty, bold storytelling of the urban experience. This series was made during the last part of his life. But the 1960s are important in terms of the timing because this is a time when photography is starting to be tested for its limits. Ouija chose to take portraits of the presidential candidates in 1968. So it's about the political experience. And then through unabashed distortion, and he creates a very political commentary. The process took place in the dark room by using heat or hot water, boiling water, to warp the negative. And then, he, or he would print through a curved glass taking all of these portraits to a new level of parody. And I'd like you to notice that there are two of President Johnson, and both of them, he has a Pinocchio-esque nose. So that gives you an indication of what Ouija was trying to convey. Some of the images he wrote on, some of the writings were respectful, referring to the proper title of the person. Some of them, like, for example, the one of um, Rockefeller, it's just Rockefeller, as if the Nelson is not significant, and it's the Rockefeller name and the family and the foundation that matters the most. This particular collector, in fact, studied photography at Georgia State University under Elizabeth Turk, John McWilliams, and Nancy Marshall. She learned the process of making an image she appreciates the black and white process, appreciates the elements of a modernist look um, and work. And of course, the one difference in all the images is the one on the left of Robert F. Kennedy, where it becomes three-dimensional. And Ouija added these campaign pins to the portrait of RFK. Now, interesting enough, in the same year, 1968. Different objective. Still during a time of testing photography's limits. Nine swimming pools by Ed Rouché. The formal device and concept to create uninflected images of one type of an object, like in a typology. 
and to present them in a sequence. This is meant to be seen as a whole, not as a linear progression, but as a whole. Like he says, a catalog of neutral objective facts. So we see that he has taken an object, a pool, and he has given us a selection of pools, residential to public to commercial. But yet it is not about the man-made object, rather it is about the concept for him. The central image in the group is the only one in which there is a trace of human activity, wet footprints. Continuing to push the boundaries, playing with the process are more examples in the exhibition. These actually are 60 years apart from the time that they were created. On the left, Edward Quigley, Crescendo, 1931. And on the right, Invocation, 1992, by Adam Foose. Both of these are cameraless images. Foose, of course, is very well known for this accidental process that he came upon and the color photograms that he's well known for. Quigley, on the other hand, was very well known back in the 1930s, but is relatively unknown now. When Quigley made his print, it was a time of experimentation in the influences of uh, the surrealist ideas. He was going for a non-objective spatial form where light is dematerialized to create this purely elegant image. And of course, it is a unique print. The collector who collected the Quigley print started looking into photography by going to New York and in fact had the fortune of being able to go at a time when the Witkin Gallery was open in New York. And through the Witkin Gallery, he learned about the works of Quigley. And he says that he prefers photography like this that is sort of like a sonnet to him. It says something to him. And that every time he looks at this, he continues to be fascinated by it and excited by it. Invocation on the right, as I mentioned before, is a color photogram that came by accident to Fuss. But for Fuss, he was influenced by Madonna and child icons when he started thinking about using a child in a vat of water. The water being a metaphor for life and death, the ripples becoming an, an echo of the event of the child's movement. This particular collector went to Fuse's studio, met with him, talked with him, saw how he worked. And when she looks at this photograph, relates her own way of traveling to that of the way a child explores. More contemporary experimentation, Vic Moons, these are both his images, but owned by different collectors. Charles Baudelaire, 1997 on the left, and Untitled, After Van Gogh on the right. Both of these are illusions. This is what Munz is going for. On the left, you see Munz's sub subversive wit and humor. Like a lot of postmodernists, he has redefined what the original is, the original being Baudelaire, which was the portrait of Baudelaire from which Munz has now made a chocolate paint, painting of and then photographed it. He's also deconstructing the idea of what that an, a photograph is an image of truth. He says that one of his objectives when he creates work like both of these is that he wants to add that wow, that when someone looks at something, they go, wow. On the right, the Van Gogh, this is an example of where Munz has acknowledged that growing up in Brazil during a time of political suppression, art was created there with these encoded messages. And that's what he was thinking of when he created this collage of Pantone chips. That when it's like a pointless painting, when you stand up close to it, everything seems to disappear into squares sort of like a pixelated photograph. And yet when you stand away, it optically merges. 
for the collector of the Baudelaire chocolate painting. He liked the subversive quality of this. And the irony is, is that Baudelaire was a French critic who did not believe that photography would stand. That painting was, was lost because of what photography had done. In fact, he considered anyone who dabbled in photography as being close to lunacy. And this is what the collector likes, is that kind of subversive wit. On the right, the Van Gogh by Munz. The, when I talked to the collector about this one, he said he would have been willing to mortgage his house to buy it. But he stood by his rule of never spending more than $2,000. So he waited until there was a special edition through Aperture, and that's how he obtained the image. He, in fact, the uh, collector on the right said that Munz's work is now central to what he likes best about photography, its ability to be an illusion. Oops. More postmodernist influence, as well as the importance of the title, would pertain to these two. The Look of Fear, 1999, by Gerald Slada on the left, and Self Portrait, 2005, by Tim Davis. Slada, known for his photo montages. He's also an artist who works in several other medias, most notably film and video, which means that. He works with media in which he can cut, paste, edit. So of course, it would come naturally that he would do the same with photography. So in this mixed media piece, he has used multiple negatives. He has cut the photograph, he has torn it, he has reattached it, and then re-photographed it. One critic referred to it as being sort of slightly deranged. But as well, we have to look at this photograph of Slada's and see that this photograph is a document of his performance in the darkroom, his performance in making the actual photograph. And Slada wants us to finish the negative, so he gives us a title, The Look of Fear, thought-provoking. We, we have to figure out what exactly does that mean and how does it pertain to the photograph. Self-Portrait on the right from Davis's Permanent Collection series. An example of where he has appropriated the work of another to comment on how we look at art, what we choose to look at. And now, as you know, in many museums, a lot of notable paintings are being put behind glass to protect them from the elements. So when we're looking at a painting that is behind glass, how do we shift our vision so as to avoid seeing the glare of the lights in the room. So instead of shifting and avoiding those lights, he lets us see the light. So the reflections become like some sort of eerie extension of Van Gogh's self-portrait, of his eyes and his mouth. This particular collector took a class in art history and hasn't stopped loving art since then. And what he likes about this particular work is that it skews and plays with art history. And I want to point out that I find it interesting that Davis titled this self-portrait. He didn't say self-portrait after Van Gogh. He said self-portrait. So is he referring to self-portrait being Van Gogh and his self-portrait, or is he referring this to being his own self-portrait? Layers of meaning. More playing with the photo process, but also playing with our visual perception. These are both German artists. On the left is Marco Breuer. Now, he is an example of someone whose work was attractive to the collector because of the performance. She loves the idea that the photograph that you're seeing is a document of how Breuer, in the dark room, will heat, puncture, scratch at the chromogenic paper before he exposes it and develops it. So it's the physicality of making the photograph, not the taking of the photograph, that she finds fascinating about this. 
This is his private performance and the physicality as a result. On the right, in Ar Architecture of Density by Michael Wolf, who, is a, uh, who now lives in China, he is very interested in vernacular culture. But there is clearly a de emphasize on the elements of the culture in such a way that we start looking at the visual elements instead. We see a sea of vertical patterns punctuated by these tiny windows. So it becomes very ge geometric in its presentation. You stand away from it. It looks like these long, vertical, concrete panels. Yet you stand close to it, and what you begin to notice is all the differences, how each window is different. One window's open, another window's open. There's curtains, there's a flower pot in the window. These collectors didn't even realize that they were collectors until someone told them they were collectors. And what they prefer is work that has this sense of minimalism. No people, that very graphic, calligraphic work. They also told me that when they first started collecting, their friends thought they were crazy. Who's laughing now? If we go back to early photography, before words like and mo modernism was applied, you see in a close-up view of the Imperial Library of the Louvre, taken in 1856 by Edward Denis Baldus, you see this de-emphasizing of the library and emphasizing of the texture of the rocks, the architonic elements, the arch, the dynamic shapes, lines, the visual elements are what we are drawn to, as well as the fact that this is a cropped view, just like we saw with uh, Michael Wolfe's, where Baldus has moved the camera in. Here are two visions, 60 years apart, yet similar in concept the visual elements being the emphasis. On the left, you have Frederick Summer's Arizona landscape, and on the right, uh, Edward Bertinsky's aerial view of the intersection 105 and 110 in Los Angeles. The left, taken in 1943, the one on the right in 2003. Summer, trained as an architect, knew how to delineate structure and design in the natural environment. And what does he do? He takes a landscape picture and does a no-no. There's no horizon line. These are horizonless landscapes. Finely detailed visual elements, the quality of tension to the surface elements, so that when we get close to this photograph, we can feel as if we can crawl underneath the surface of it. The collectors of the summer piece, in fact, were friends with Summer, venturing out to Arizona several times to meet and talk with him. And they started buying his work without even realizing that they were collecting. And now they want to share their discoveries with us. The Bertinsky on the right, same kind of looking at something where it is a completely filled in picture frame. And the aerial view reduces the chaos, which at eye level would be quite crowded and a mess of lines. He, he does what Cartes da, did back in the 30s and 40s. So it becomes, this Bertinsky's view almost becomes modernist in his pa patterning. But of course now, instead of a small black and white print, Bertinsky takes it to another level in making it a large scale color spectacle, where everything is equalized, where the cars become like little tiny matchbox cars. And of course, printing it as a pigment print adds a very painterly look to the details.
cropping and flattening of space in another full frame are the works of Timothy O'Sullivan on the left and Roger Ballin on the right, one taken in 1873, the other taken in 2000. O'Sullivan, of course, was part of a geological survey out in the American West, documenting the um, rocks and monuments, as well as the writings, and in this case, the record of a previous explorer, the Spanish in 1526 out in the American West, documenting it and measuring it for scale. Yet O'Sullivan brings his cool, objective approach to draw our attention not only to the, his interest in the naturalism of the rock, but also the rhythm, the sense of design in the handwriting in this memento. On the right, Ballin takes a different approach. This is part of his shadow chamber, where we see evidence of human act presence, sort of like the Lascaux caves, the messages and drawings of children, Documentary, maybe. Surreal, definitely. Perhaps the hard shadows of the wires like Plato's cave. More emphasis on the visuals. This one on the left by Gretchen Huffel playing with scale. This is from 1999. Playing with scale like a, an optical illusion, large and small. She made many ins, full-size installations and then would photograph them very closely, creating these pieces that are witty, witty intelligent, in this case a toy cameraman in flower, and of course sets it in black and white and then creates a small print surrounded by a large white mat. So again, you see the small, large juxtaposition. On the right, Walker Evans's sink, photographed by John T. Hill back in 1975, filled with tiny details like the flip tops, letters on the upper right-hand side, sharp focus, shapes, factual, the collector of the Evans piece, of um, the Hills piece of Walker Evans's sink said that it was the magic of light that is important to him, and that the collectors bought this because they personally knew Evans, and they wanted to share their collection with those who can appreciate the modernist vision, as well as their early passion for photography, which is what led them to also collect. these images of African mass taken by Walker Evans. These objects were selected for a traveling exhibition by the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and Evans was hired to photograph them. And he does a beautiful, he did a beautiful job in these august glow of the prints. The real, the object is just presented. Very straightforward. And yet there is this wonderful detail in the form and face, which has, had always been an interest of his, to create a visual fact that's so natural, so neutral. It's not high contrast. It's quiet. It's not dramatic. Evans said that photography worked best when it calls the least attention to itself. Moving forward, I want to relate the African mask as an object to the found objects held by both of these children. And of course, both of these being documentary uh, photographs. On the left, Pablo with Doll's Head, 1966, by Robert Frank. And on the right, After the Hurricane Allison, Pennsylvania, 1985, by Lynn Whitney. Robert Frank, of course, credited with rewriting the rules of photography in his book, The Americans. This was taken during a time when he had receded from public life due to the criticism of the book. It's a gray, grainy scene, yet powerful image. His young son, who is now deceased, holds a damaged doll's head without eyes. And behind him, the gesture of a man in the middle putting on sunglasses 
on a cloudy day. This particular collector actually perked his the work in the 90s. He had been to see the he had been recommended by a family member to go see the moving out retrospective of Frank's work at the National Gallery in Washington in 1994 and he went to see it and he was so moved by this image that he knew he wanted he he wanted to have it. On the right after the hurricane this Lynn Whitney is currently a professor at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. But back when she made this photograph, she happened to have been the teacher of the collector. She was teaching at Yale University at that time. And he talked about how he learned about black and white from her, about American photography. And so he credited her with uh, learning how to seek the work of strong practitioners of the craft. And when we look at the photograph, we see, like Frank's, the boy holds something. He holds broken toys. The adults behind them, busy with their loss as fire consumes the house. If we move towards documentary work of the urban environment, Lunch Counter, New York City, by Bruce Davidson, 1961, on the left, and Madison Avenue, New York City, 1973, by Mitch Epstein. Both of them coming out of the influences from Harry Callahan working on the streets of Chicago in the 1950s and Walker Evans in his Subway series from 1958. They're part of a generation of photographers who were interested in capturing the city like a theater set in the urban environment. And yet they weren't seeking to really say anything. Rather, it was about making an observation with a comment. On the left, you see two women of different races sitting at a lunch counter. 1961, time of the civil rights. And yet Davidson doesn't give us any more than that in the title. We have to decide what he's saying. But yet we, we sense the tension. If you look at the woman on the right, the white woman, her elbows are out. She's clearly choosing her space. The woman on the left, the black woman, her arms are in. Her eyes are looking at us. She's worried. The collectors of this particular work feel that these are the kind of works they, they choose to put on their walls because they want to teach their children about the social and class issues of today through works done like this. Madison Avenue on the right, a documentary photograph, yes. Color is the difference because in 1973, photographers were figuring out how to use color in a way that described rather than decorated an idea. So when we look at the color photograph of Epstein, we see how color punches out at us, how the pinks encircle the activity. We wonder what is happening. All the women seem to be looking for something. And if you look closely at the woman with the red fingernails and her gesture, for those of you who have lost contact lenses, I think you'll recognize that, that touch. Was he saying something about the good in society that people are helping each other? Stopping? This, in fact, was a gift from the parents of one collector because in his family, it is a tradition that they give each other gifts of art. Lafayette, Louisiana, on the left by Lee Freelander, and on the right, Wilmington, North Carolina, El by Elliot Erwitt. Both of these very undervaluated, overlooked photographers. Both of them with amazing abilities. Elliot Erwitt, of course, a sly humor, makes us laugh out loud because he's so attuned to the nuances of life. Here, an accidental relationship of gesture and expression. On the left, Lee Friedlander. He loved to break the sacred canons. He was doing everything in this photograph that photography teachers tell their students not to do. The woman's back is to us and our lens. The, 
the pole in the middle, and then, of course, it's his shadow on the pole. So all the things, and that was what Friedlander's work was about, was about breaking those canons. He, he really had this, has this amazing ability to be unobtrusive in making a photograph, to create something that gets on the edge of meaning, and yet there's no overt judgment. Both of these images are real people. They're not staged documentary observations. The collector of the Irwin said that she loved the intimacy of this print, the black and white, almost archaic process. She learned an appreciation for photography through her uncle, who was a photographer. And so she also appreciates the tension and magic of the darkroom and Irwin's intuitive vision. If we move to the site of uh, activity in the land, both destructive and redemptive, we can look at two different photographs of Atlanta, one taken in 1864 on the right and one taken in 1983 on the left. On the right, George Bernard's Civil War scene of a um, uh, activity taking place in Atlanta. There's no drama, no action. Of course, the reason being because of the limitations of the process at this time. On the left, 120 years later, Joel Sternfeld, in, for, this is from his American Prospects. He's known for these landscape images that comment on contemporary civil, civilization and its contradictions. Very detailed. We expect drama, emotion, but it is held back. But clearly there are issues of race and class in this scene taken on a street in Vinings. This is also an example of how the collectors on the left use photography. They feel photography is an easier art form to understand and it helps others as well as their children. Both of these images can say things about the land, what we do to it, how we control it, whether it's through war or in the name of aesthetics, like suburban landscapes. On the right, the collector once collected Civil War memorabilia, and then he moved to photography and never looked back, and that is what he collects now. And he loves the large format, the ability to look at a photograph and, and be able to walk in his mind and to a place that once existed. More about man and the land. Frederick Summers Coyote holds our attention and we remember it. A reminder of mortality and beauty in an unexpected way. The preciseness draws us into the visual textures. The collectors consider Summer to be one of the most important photographer, and they reminded me of something that Emmett Gowan wrote in the foreword to a book on Summer. In referring to Summer's work, he stated, you will never look at, work, at art in the same way. Death, man, and the land. An artillery range on the left taken in 1863 another Civil War document, a target range on the coast, beautiful water, beautiful scenes, except here we see an artillery range, the land as a place of an event, a war. On the right, Colorado Springs taken in 1968 by Robert Adams. Almost this objective detachment from the land. Adams, of course, later becoming part of the new topographics movement in 1975, an exhibition in which they acknowledge the man altered land, the existence of contemporary industrial culture. Both of these are cropped views. On the right, we see the trailer, the lawn chairs, what's happened to the land. The collector on the left uses the internet to find unique images like this goes to fairs, networks, to find his, his treasures, as he refers to them. On the right, another gift to the collector from his parents, who encouraged his interest in photography. 
returning once again to control or lack of control, as you can see on the left in William Eggleston's Memphis. And it's interesting because the Eggleston was done about the same time as Robert Adams's. But of course, Eggleston is going for a different kind of concept in his work. Cool, descriptive, more about form and line, about the quiet glory of commonness. On the right, in Inspecting from 2003 by Scott McFarland, McFarland is known for his invented, digitally altered landscapes. This particular body of work, he explores gardens and their maintenance. So he's capturing reality, but he's digitally manipulating it. And of course, he relates tending a garden to taking a photograph where you have water and light as the essential elements. If we want to take collecting and looking at the land in another way, you have today's fictive strategies and the element of chance in both. Carla and the Pitbull by Katie Grannon on the left and USA 2003 by Shannon Ebner on the right. <clears throat> Grannon's work is from her Sugar Camp Road series. The landscape is a vehicle for a scene that is soul-searching and sexually eerie. The pastoral landscape could quite possibly, without the dog and the woman, be as beautiful as an Edward Steichen pond. Yet it is the activity in the foreground that disrupts its rural serenity, the pit bull, unsafe, dangerous. And of course, there's the surrealist idea of chance because it is chance that brings her subjects to her. She used to advertise through classifieds. Now she uses referrals. But what they do when they become before her camera is up to them. Ebner, who came and spoke here recently at the High, has been working in the landscape for a long time. She's interested in signage. She talked about the influences of Walker Evans, as well as the Hollywood sign. But she mo moved this concept forward after reading an article in the New York Times about the prisoners in Guantanamo Bay. So there are three political and subversive elements to this work. One is the name of the series is Dead Democracy Letters. Two, the title, USA. Does that mean Dead Democracy USA? And three, the actual chosen words, nausea. And unlike a lot of her contemporary artists, she chooses black and white because color to her just doesn't work with her ideas and she aligns it too much with, she says it's too much like advertising. The collector of the Ebner work said that she followed Ebner's work after reading a review about her work in the New York Times. And in fact, it was two years after she first found out about her work that she actually purchased this image. On the left, <clears throat> with Grannon, Grannon saw this, uh, the collector saw Grannon's work at the Whitney Museum, and he was intrigued by this kind of passive-aggressive effect, the paradox of the beauty, beautiful and the ugly, the safe and the unsafe. And finally, Deanne Arvis with the human pincushion. Ronald C. Harrison from 1963. I thought I would end with this image for several reasons. Because it has many ironies and layers to it. This was taken by David Heath. David Heath is someone who was originally from Atlanta, was in New York in the 60s, came back and in fact owned a gallery that carried photography here in Atlanta. Deanne Arbus in 1963 was relatively unknown outside of the commercial world and her circle of friends in New York. You see her as dark and shadowy, a side profile, yet she's clearly looking at us, at the camera. And she's with her work. 
a work that at that time was new, was unknown, but now, of course, is a very well-known work. This particular work was found in a bin at APAD last year, passed over for so many years, obviously, and now is in an Atlanta collection. I wanted to also add, there's another layer to this photograph in that it takes place in the studio of W. Jean Smith, who was a very famous photojournalist. A final thought that I would like to um, add about what was repeated in many of my conversations with collectors is that photography is affordable and accessible. Collectors also said, don't buy second-rate prints. They said, if you don't know the art, know art, you need to educate yourself, whether it's taking a class or reading books or talking to people. If possible, meet the artist. The personal connection between the artist and the collector seemed invaluable in most of the conversations I had. And above all, share your collection. Let other people know how wonderful your work, the work is in your collection. So in looking back at this photograph by David Heath, the question I would like to leave you with is that if any of us were there that day, <clears throat> would we have had the knowledge and wisdom to have bought Arbus's work? Let's hope so. Thank you. Anybody ask any questions? I'll take a few questions. Don't ask me any quick technical ones. <laughs> I'm not a photographer. Anybody? Oh, come on. <laughs> yes. What are the three elements that you think when you're collecting photography? the most important things, up beyond obviously the obvious, if you find that that piece is specifically emoting to you. Mm -hmm. what, what are three things that you think of that, okay, you might want to consider these three things before you buy that first piece or you begin collecting? You have to know, you have to know something about the photographer. I think it is important to know who they are, where they are in their career. I think it's important to <clears throat> I think it's important to look at the condition of the print, what kind of print process it is. Um, I can think of some of the photographs of people made in the 1970s that today are just ghosts because they were color, uh, and color was not very stable back then. I think that's an important element. Has the work been published? Where has it been? Have they had any solo exhibitions? Is the price reasonable? You know, if you're not comfortable with something, you know, you need to think about it and come back. Um, but there is, uh, I read someplace that one rule was that if, if sometimes you need to go with your heart and buy something because you love it and because you just know you can't do without it and you'll regret it if you don't. On the other hand, I also read a piece of advice that said never buy anything on vacation either. <laughs> so, uh, you know, additioning, um, matted, you know, you really need to, you know, ask the dealer to or the, you know, whoever has the piece and is selling it to open up the frame so you can look and see what the condition is. I mean, on myself, I had things framed years ago and I was told it was um, done with um, archival mounting. And I opened them several years ago to find that, no, I had not paid for archival mounting. So, you know, you need to see the print and actually look at it. Anyone else? Yes.
That's true, but I've also known people from that are commercial dealers who have also sold things that I felt were inappropriate or said things that wasn't true. Like I overheard a conversation one time that um, there was a process by which photographs that have been mounted on plexiglass, there's a way to remove them. Well, right now there is no way to remove that wouldn't expose a photograph to high intense heat for 15 seconds. Do I want to risk that? No. So, I mean, I think you have to not just listen to one voice, but you're right about buying a piece of work from someone who is just selling it, a friend of a friend or whatever. I think you have to be very careful and do your homework. You know, what is it? Fool, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. The collectors whose work has been lent for this exhibition, several of them began collecting in the 1970s. In fact, one person in the 1960s. Many of them remembered their first purchase. Andre Kertesz photograph, a Walker Evans, Apprentice Polk 